So we're continuing our series on who is Jesus as revealed in the Gospel of John. And today, we are coming up to a story that actually is going to dovetail with last Sunday a little bit. Uh, it's going to kind of be part of that story. And we're going to see Jesus as the Lord of the harvest. And so John chapter 4, verse 35 says, Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. Well, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and the harvesters a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I send you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. And so, Lord, as we bow our head and our hearts before you today, we would pray that you would help us, especially in this area, to see you in this role as the Lord of the harvest. And may we be inspired to be part of that harvest, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at the time of the great Chicago fire, the entire city rose in flames. It was a literal inferno. Residents found shelter in the waters of Lake Michigan, and the flames came close to the water's edge, but eventually died out there. Well, Pastor D.L. Moody found refuge in the chilly waters, and near him was this lady, a young lady, sitting by the water's edge. She had her hand in her, in her face in her hand, and she was weeping hysterically, wailing in uncontrollable sorrow. So the pastor in, in Moody tried to comfort her. He said, young lady, get a hold of yourself. You're safe now. The fire can't reach you here. Stop weeping. Listen to me. You are saved. And she said, yes, I know that I'm safe, but I didn't bring anyone with me. We're familiar with Jesus' command in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, as surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we're aware of this great commission, but truthfully, most of us struggle a little bit with it. We struggle with the idea of telling other people about our faith. Maybe we're unsure how they might receive it. Maybe we, we don't want to offend anyone, and we live in a society where people are greatly offended, and so we walk carefully. However, I don't think anyone was offended when the woman at the well ran into town saying, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Because the text tells us in verse 30 that they came out of the town and they made their way toward Jesus. The fact that this woman had gone to the well alone in the middle of the day tells us that the people in town probably already knew her story. But what they couldn't figure out was why all of a sudden she was full of life and she was full of excitement. The shame that had previously defined her was suddenly gone. She's like a new person. And they wanted to know why. What happened to her? And then they heard her talk about Jesus. A man who knew everything about her, including her sin. And yet, unlike the townspeople, chose to treat her with kindness and with compassion, and with dignity. And if this man was the Christ, if this man could accept her, if this man was willing to show her grace, then was it possible that he would do the same for them? That he would show them kindness and forgiveness as well? And who doesn't need forgiveness? I think most of us know deep down that we're not perfect, just like the woman at the well. We know that we need the forgiveness of Jesus. What we don't want is someone pointing their finger at us and telling us how good they are and how bad we are, how horrible we are. 
And that's the beauty of what this woman did. She didn't point her finger at anyone other than Jesus. She said, he's the one. He's the one who offers living water. He's the one that can forgive. He's the one who could transform a life. Look what he did in my life. Imagine what he can do in yours. Now sandwiched between Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman and then seeing all the townspeople from the village coming to see this Jesus that she was talking about, we have the disciples returning from their errand as they went into town to get food for Jesus, who, when they left him, was exhausted from the journey. He was tired. He was very thirsty, and so he said, I'll wait here by the well. And so they're a little surprised when all of a sudden they return and they find Jesus full of energy and rejoicing that a sinful woman has just been redeemed. We find it in verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Like, we got all this food for you. Just eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. What? His disciples said to each other, do you think someone brought him food? Like, did the woman, did she have sandwiches or something that she gave them to Jesus? And then Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. A task which Jesus now is going to explain to his disciples using the analogy of a harvest. And as he does so, what he's hoping is that they too might become passionate about seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That they might see how Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And that how it brings him pleasure whenever we choose to participate in that harvest. And so what do we see in the passage that might help us? The first is to open your eyes. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Years ago, Barb and I had the privilege of visiting New York City. Our hotel was a few blocks away from the subway, and so we were fairly confident that we could navigate the city and get around with ease. But what we didn't realize is once we got down into the subway, there was 28 different routes that trains were going. They were going every which way. And so here we are standing off, you know, there's people going everywhere, and they're traveling at, at, at breakneck speed to where they're going, and we're standing in the busy corridor off to the side with our little map. And we're trying to figure out which train that we're to catch to catch the next train that we want to go uh, downtown. Well, people are coming, pushing by us. And then finally, this kind gentleman recognized, well, that we were in desperate help, in need of help. And he stopped and asked where we were heading. And he showed us which train to catch and where to get off and catch the next one. And it's interesting, out of all of those passengers who were walking by us that day, he alone seemed to notice our plight. And if others did notice the plight, they weren't willing to stop, so he alone noticed our plight and was willing to take the time to point us in the direction we needed to go. And I wonder, how many people are there out there that are looking for the way to get to the Heavenly Father, but with all the voices out there, there seems to be confusion. Do I take this route? Do I take that route? What, what, what route do I take? How do I get to the Father? And they're unsure whether they'll even find the right way. And like Barb and I in the subway station, they're not flagging people down. Who wants to look like a, a hapless stranger not knowing where you're going? No, we don't want to be doing that, looking like we're in a panic. But still, they don't know how to find Jesus. Maybe they need someone like that man, someone that was familiar with the way, someone who was willing to stop and take some time to listen and to explain how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he is the one that can meet the greatest needs in our lives. 
But let's be honest, we're kind of like those people sometimes. Running off to work or running off to an appointment with a doctor or, or running off and we're too busy focusing on our own problems, our own demands, our own schedules to see people standing on, off on the corridor with their little map trying to figure out the way. Sometimes we forget to do what that man in the subway did. We forget to lift up our eyes and look. Have you ever watched people as they walk along? walking in the subway, walking in a crowd. What are they doing? A lot of them are fixated on their phones. Some are just looking at the path ahead of them. They don't want to trip over a curb or anything. And not very many are looking up. And it's easy for us to do the same. We get focused on this life. We get focused on our, our tasks. We get focused on everything. And so Jesus reminds us, maybe we need to look up. I'm not sure how anxious that woman was that day to engage Jesus in conversation. She lived in a culture where men didn't talk to women in public, and Samaritans definitely didn't talk to Jews. I wonder, I'm speculating. Did the disciples, as they were journeying into town, see the woman walking toward the well? Did they wonder, why is she carrying a water jar in the heat of the day? Or were they just trying to figure out where's the marketplace in the town and where's the McDonald's? Did they smile? Did they think to themselves, oh, she's heading toward Jesus. I wonder what he'll say to her. Hmm, do you think she'll be different when we get back? Well, from their reaction, I don't think that they were considering that because they didn't see this woman as someone who they would have chose to invite to become part of the harvest. Look at verse 27. Just then the disciples returned, and they were surprised. Surprised to find him talking with this woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Have you ever noticed how Jesus had a way of breaking through the, the barriers that the religious people of his day had set up to keep certain people out? Samaritans, tax collectors, lepers, sinners. Remember when Jesus called Levi, come follow me, Levi the tax collector, who we affectionately know as Matthew? It's found in Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet at his house for Jesus, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect began to complain to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them and said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. But the Pharisees weren't comfortable around sinners. And the disciples weren't really all that comfortable in Samaria either. But have you ever noticed how sometimes God leads us to uncomfortable places, uncomfortable conversations, because he is not unable to work in the midst of those? Often he does his best work in the midst of uncomfortable places. Richard Cohen, in his book, Reluctant, The Reluctant Evangelism, or Evangelist, tells of a time when he was in college. He finally mustered up enough courage to invite a, a fellow classmate named Rachel. I wonder if she was pretty. <clears throat> he had got the courage to call and ask Rachel to go to church with him. So the night before, he called just to remind her, and when he phoned her, her roommate Sarah answered the phone. And Sarah explained that Rachel actually had gone away for the weekend. And then she said, why? What were you inviting her to anyway? Oh, no, nothing, nothing much, she said, a little embarrassed. No, really, she said. Where were you going to go? Oh, just church, don't worry about it. And then she said, well, can I come instead? 
So that Sunday, Sarah went to church with Richard. And at the end of the message, the pastor said, if anyone wants to become a Christian, why don't you come down to the front of the church and I'll pray with you. And in it, to his complete shock, Sarah stood up and she walked down to the front of the church and she gave her life to Christ. He said, my pathetic evangelistic reluctance was brutally exposed that night. But he also learned another important lesson, that the Holy Spirit is already at work in the hearts of people all around us. And therefore, we need to look up and be willing to participate in that work. Whenever we go to Costco and have supper, it's always a challenge to find a table to sit at. Have you guys found that? So while I stand in line trying to get our chicken and french fries, Barb goes up to somebody unsuspecting that's sitting at a table by themselves and says, oh, can we share this table with you? And most of the time they say yes. Then I come with the food and I sit down and I pray and I thank the Lord for the food and for our new friends. Well, this week when I thank the Lord for our new friends, the woman said, and amen. It seems that they went to Central Pentecostal Tabernacle in Edmonton years ago and knew a whole bunch of people that we knew. But it's amazing how many spiritual conversations we've had with complete strangers, all because Barb will go and say, we need some place to sit. And you have two seats beside you. Would you be willing for us to sit down beside you? And all of a sudden now we have these conversations and you never know what God might do with those conversations or how God might use them to point someone to Jesus or how the simple fact of just thanking the Lord for, his, or for our food and for our new friends can break down some barriers. Paul said to the believers, for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To both, he says, we are a pleasing aroma. And so are we willing to look around us, to look up and discover that there might be somebody out there that responds to that pleasing aroma, that fragrance of Jesus that's upon us. You ever gone to someone's house after church and, and, and they've invited you and, and you enter the house and there's a, the smell of a roast beef dinner? You ever, do you know that smell? You know what I'm talking about? And you go in and you think, oh, I'm not very hungry. No, usually that smell makes your stomach jump a little bit, doesn't it? And you think, wow, the aroma, the fragrance, now I'm hungry I'm hungry for what that is promising me. And that's what Jesus is, or Paul is saying through here. We have the fragrance of Jesus, and hopefully people sense that fragrance, and it's a positive one, not a negative one, but a positive fragrance. And they say, I would like to know more about Jesus. David Finch in his book, The Faithful Presence, says, the authority of preaching does not derive from a person's expertise in Bible knowledge reasons for believing, or rhetoric. Although these skills may be of help, no proclamation is spoken from a place of weakness and humility. It tells the gospel from a place of having witnessed it, seen it, and being humbled by it. And isn't that exactly what's happening with the woman at the well? She went to the well in the heat of the day to avoid gossip and the dirty looks that she often received from the townspeople. She had done her best to be invisible. That is, until Jesus asked her, would you please give me a drink? You see, she was not invisible to him, nor was she despised. And Jesus offered her in that conversation something she would have never dreamed of or something she couldn't have attained on her own. No, he offered her living water. Well, at first she didn't understand Living water, what are you talking about? There's, that means I'd never have to drink from this water again. And, and Jesus was patient. And he allowed the Holy Spirit to work on her heart until suddenly it happened and she realized the living water he was talking about was him. 
And she began to realize who Jesus is. And then leaving her water jar, she went back into the town and said to the people, Come, come, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And I love the part of the story where she leaves the jar behind because it's a sign that she's actually been filled with living water or at least an indication that she's coming back to the well. What did we do with this one that is hiding in shame and now declaring, I met a man who told me everything I ever did? How could she go from that place of shame to this place of proclamation? I think it's because for the first time in a long time, she sensed that she was loved and that she was valued. And although nothing had changed in the circumstances of her life, everything had changed in the depths of her soul. For she found something in Jesus she hadn't experienced for an awful long time, life and forgiveness and dignity. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. There's a lot of people out there who are longing to be found. The second thing he calls us to is to be reapers. I sent you out to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. A couple of years ago, a man approached me after church, and he said, you don't know me, but I want to tell you my story. And then he talked about this friend that he had in university, and they were talking about whether or not God was real. And that's when he discovered that his friend was a Christian. Well, he was riding on the sky train home, and he was pondering that conversation, and he prayed, God, if you're real, you have to show me a sign. And just then he looked up, it was nighttime, and he looked up and he saw our cross right here. You know how you go out and you see? He saw the cross on top of the church. When he got home, he called his friend. He said, I think I need to give my life to Christ. His friend led him to the Lord. And he said, I just wanted you to know that this Sunday, last Sunday, me and my family were baptized in water at the church that they had gone to with his friend. But I wanted you to know, and I wanted to give glory to God, how he used the cross on your church to impact my life. You know, that's the exciting thing about participating with Jesus in the harvest. We never know who or maybe what he might use. And sometimes I'm encouraged, if God can use our neon cross, then, well, then God can probably use me. I wonder, though, that friend that had that conversation in the cafeteria before he went home, if, if he kind of was thinking, oh, I blew that one. The message of Jesus seemed to fall on deaf ears. But how excited he must have been when he got that phone call of his friend who said, I want to become a Christian. Psalm 126 verse 5 says, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. And that's what this, experience, this person experienced. Sometimes when we participate in the harvest, we sow seed. We tell people about Jesus. We wonder maybe if there will ever be a harvest. And I wonder if that friend wondered if his friend who saw the cross would ever give his life to Christ. And then there's times where, like that man, we are given the privilege to pray with someone to lead them to Christ. And of course, we need to be prepared to do both. William Barclay said, if the harvest of men is ever to be reaped, then everyone must be a reaper. For there is someone whom each one of us could and must bring to God. Lloyd Ogilvie, who is a U.S. chaplain to the Senate, or former U.S. chaplain to the Senate, he said, heaven should be full of people who will cheer when we enter and say, we're here because of you, because you loved us enough to tell us about Jesus. John Hyde was a missionary to India, and some people wondered, what on earth was he doing there? He had very few gifts that most missionaries had. He was partially deaf, and so he couldn't hear people. And he had a lot of trouble learning the Indian languages. And he tended to like to be alone in his study rather than out there in the streets with people. Well, one year, though, he came to a passage talking about the Lord of the harvest, and he began to pray for the harvest. 
He asked the Lord of the harvest to help him lead one person a day to know Christ. Colleagues looked at him and thought, you're crazy. That's an impossible task. What are you praying for that for? And yet by year end, he had led 400 people to know the Lord. He had discovered that there's a harvest all around him, and he just needed to participate. So what do we do then? When we talk to someone about Jesus and they don't believe, well, what do we do? Well, I think we just be faithful. Adoram Judson spent six years in Burma before he ever saw a convert. The great missionary William Carey spent seven years in India before he ever saw any fruit from his labor. Sometimes we're sowing, sometimes we're reaping, sometimes we're watering. All those things are important. And that's why it's important that we go to our last point, and that is we need to pray, trusting the Lord to do his work as the Lord of the harvest. And so we go to the Gospel of Luke, and a different story, but the same premise, the fact that there is a harvest. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And this word ask that Jesus uses is asking with an urgent request or a pleading. Ian Bounds says, uh, intercession is the heart's cry for souls. And so we begin to pray for souls. We pray for laborers to enter into the harvest field with the purpose of both planting seed, watering, and collecting the harvest. And then we might be surprised that as we begin to pray, that we'll sense the Holy Spirit asking us to go, that he will inspire us to tell, to share the message of Jesus, to find those who are lost and wanting to be found or just looking for a way, the way to the Father, and he'll give us the words to say. Have you ever noticed how people are excited to talk about the things that excite them? You don't have to spend time with someone very long, and you find out what excites them. If they like NASCAR racing, they're going to talk about NASCAR racing. If they like embroidery, well, you're going to hear about it. You're going to know if something excites them. Richard Copeland, in his book, The Reluctant Evangelist, says, the main reason most of us struggle to speak about Christ to friends and colleagues is not because we're struggling to understand our culture, but because we're not very excited about God. And maybe that's why Jesus encourages us to pray, to make sure that that relationship that we have with him is vital and, and vibrant and exciting and that we don't forget how wonderful Jesus is and all the great things that he's done in our lives. And then out of love and devotion, we just naturally will spill out Jesus to those around us as we talk about the goodness of God and the things that God has done for us. John Bunyan, who is the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, he was saved because he overheard towns ladies as they were doing their, their laundry, hanging up their line. They were talking about all the good things that God was doing in their lives, how God was faithful here and how God was faithful there. And here he is listening to the conversation. And little did they know that that conversation, just talking about the good things of God, would result in John Bunyan's salvation. Richard Culkin, he also responds, and he says, never despair if you don't see much fruit from your conversations about Jesus, because God can use the things we say to save people long after we've forgotten what we talked about. Indeed, we may not know until we get to heaven. In other words, just be faithful. Lift your eyes. Talk about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. Don't do pointing. No, just talk about how good God is. Hey, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the one? When Jesus shared the message of the harvest with his disciples, he was preparing them for what was about to happen in Samaria. This woman had just been saved. She's run off in a town full of excitement. And little did they know, but Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit was going to use her testimony to impact the whole village. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two more days. And because of the words, many more became believers. They were brought into the kingdom of God. The fact that Jesus stayed two extra days showed that he cared about them. 
He cared about these Samaritans, which most Jews didn't care about, but he did. And he was proclaiming that people are precious to God. A few years ago, we were on holidays, and, and we were walking along a path and a trail, and I, and I kind of, oh, whoa, I don't have my wallet. And you know how sickening a feeling that is. And so instead of carrying on on our journey, we turned around and we made our way back, going everywhere that we were. And, and we're, we're walking back, trying to figure out if I dropped it somewhere. And then I remembered how uncomfortable it was sitting on my wallet. And I had pulled it out and put it in the console of the car. And so with rapid steps, I walked towards my car, opened it, and was very relieved, of course, to find it exactly where I put it, safe and sound. Jesus urges us to be mindful of the harvest, to do our part, to be as passionate about the harvest, the lost people, as I was about a lost wallet. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. As followers of Jesus, I pray that we will not forget about people, people who, like us, deserve to hear the good news of Jesus, that he's willing to bring forgiveness to all who repent. He's willing to help us discover and understand the joy of knowing God. John speaks of this, the author of the gospel. He speaks in the letter of John, 1 John chapter 3. How great is the love the Father's lavished on us. This is tremendous what God has done, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. There's something exciting about being his, and that bubbles out from our hearts and in our lives. And I wonder today, if you're here or you're watching online, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Have you met him yet? Or are you still looking? You're still standing there with your map, hoping that someone would show you the way. Well, we can come to know Jesus right now. And maybe you want to pray with me this prayer. Dear Jesus, I come to you today, and I am thankful that even though you know everything about me, you still love me. I realize that my sin has separated me from you and prevents me from experiencing your love. Thank you for coming to earth to save me from the eternal consequences of my sin by dying in my place on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead and as such can grant me eternal life. And so today I ask you to come into my life to forgive my sin and to help me serve you each and every day. Amen. It's just a prayer. That's the start. And then, maybe our circumstances don't change much, but we can say, come, meet a man oh, that told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Christ? Could he be the one you're looking for? And maybe, just maybe, someone will say, actually, he is. So, Lord, we bow our heads and our heads before you, and we pray that you would help us in this area of being involved in the harvest field. We thank you, Lord, how you used this lady because she was passionate about you and passionate about what you did in her life. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would use us in the harvest field, that we, too, would be passionate about you and passionate what you've done in our lives. We pray that we would lift our eyes. We pray that we would participate in the harvest, but also that we would be people of prayer, that you would show us, Lord, those that are around us that, that need our care, need our love, need our grace, because our world in many ways does not have that. And so, Lord, we pray that as we, as we demonstrate that through our actions and through our words, that there will be opportunities to talk about your goodness and your faithfulness. And then in those moments, your Holy Spirit will be able to take those very words and impact hearts and lives. And so let us be tellers of the story, tellers of the story of all that you have done. And we pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close by singing.